السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Dear brothers and sisters أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسولنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وأشهد أن محمد رسول الله In the name of God, the most merciful, the most compassionate All thanks and praise be to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala The Lord of the whole universe I bear witness that there is no deity worthy of worship except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and I bear witness that Muhammad peace be upon him is the messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Peace be upon all of you dear brothers and sisters welcome to our program spiritual fireside chat. Tonight inshallah we are going to start another beautiful series with Dr. Gasser Hathoud inshallah. So the series will be uh, for the full month, uh, four sessions for Thursdays, and the general title is Science and the Quran, inshallah. It is a beautiful and exciting topic, and for this topic, of course, we, have, we are excited to have Dr. Gasser. But before I invite him, I would like to recite a few verses from Surah Al-Mu'minun, and we would like to start our program with Quranic recitation. This is chapter 23, and the verses from 12 to 16. I picked this, uh, these verses. The reason is, inshallah, tonight Dr. Gasser is going to focus on embryology in the Quran, inshallah. And the following Thursday, his topic is going to be the miracle of water. And then the final two sessions will be on the story of sunshine and iron, you know, part one and part two. So this will be the plan. And also, I would like to give you a little information about the flow of the program. After the recitation, I will invite Dr. Gasser, inshallah, and his presentation is going to be about 40 minutes. And in the meantime, if you have any questions, please, please post your questions, you know, in the chat box, so I can ask uh, your questions to Dr. Gasser. And once we are done with the presentation and the Q&A session, uh, I will call the event and we will pray Salatul Aisha and finish with the final prayers, inshallah. So with this, I would like to put the Quranic verses on the screen and we'll start with the recitation. And afterwards, I will invite Dr. Gasser, inshallah. A'udhu billahi minash shaytanir rajeem. وَلَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ مِنْ سُلَالَةٍ مِنْ طِينٍ ثُمَّ جَعَلْنَاهُ نُطْفَةً فِي قَرَارٍ مَكِينٍ ثم خلقنا النطفة علقة فخلقنا العلقة مضغة مضغة فخلقنا المضغة عظاما فكسونا العظام لحما ثم أنشأ Nahu ثم إنكم يوم القيامة تبعثون صدق الله العظيم. Okay, once again, peace be upon all of you, dear brothers and sisters. As I mentioned at the beginning, we are going to start with a beautiful series, which is science and the Quran. And tonight's topic is embryology in the Quran. 
And for this subject, the best person to speak is, inshallah, Dr. Gasser Hathout, one of our lecturers and speakers and the khatibs. So please help me welcome Dr. Gasser Hathout. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, Dr. Gasser. Alaikum as salam wa rahmatullah, alaikum as salam. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Um, okay, uh, this will be sort of a multimedia presentation here, inshallah. So I will try to uh, figure out how to uh, how to do this. I want to jump right into the, the science, and uh, then afterwards, inshallah, I will um, I will uh, you know make a commentary uh, for a few minutes, and then we'll take questions and. What I would like to do, inshallah, is um, I have already pre-recorded this uh, for Islamicity. And so I would like to start by um, uh, playing the, the videos. Uh, but I think to do that, I need to, uh, I need to, uh, figure out, uh, I need to be able to um, have you hear the, the uh, videos that I play. And I, so I'm just going to attempt to work on the sharing screen uh, to uh, redo that. I'm going to stop sharing for a second and then come back to share uh, because I would like to Yes, now I believe that should do it, inshallah. And so now you should be able to see and hear. Sheikh Asim, can you see? We can see it. We have Wonderful. Been. Okay, then let me begin playing it. And inshallah, you will be able to hear it. And there will be two videos, about 12 minutes each, that are part of the uh, series of uh, science in the Quran that is on Islamicity. Uh, they were kind enough to host a space for me for my series, Science and the Quran. After the two videos that, inshallah, I will wrap up with a commentary that will push this material a little bit further, and then, inshallah, we'll take some questions. Assalamu alaikum. Welcome back to our Science and the Quran series. Today, inshallah, we're going to be talking about embryology in the Quran. And by now, you know the approach. Sometimes we'll look at some verses and we'll say, SubhanAllah, this is a miracle. Other times we'll look at verses that talk about nature, but don't make a very specific statement. And what we're doing by talking about the science is reaching a deeper appreciation of those verses, rather than in any sense trying to it really is Allah validate the Qur'an. We are coming at this as people who are already believers in the Qur'an and really trying to deepen our appreciation. Thirdly, sometimes we'll just talk about generalities, philosophical issues, laws of nature that may not even relate to a specific verse, but just give us an overall better education and appreciation about the majesty and the subtlety with which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created this universe. However, the verses about embryology are probably in that quote-unquote miracle verse category. And I'd like to start this session with a quote from Professor Keith Moore, Professor of Anatomy and Associate Dean of Basic Sciences, now retired, Professor Emeritus, Faculty of Medicine at the University of Toronto. For those in the medical field, you will already be very familiar with Professor Moore because his anatomy and embryology textbooks are probably the most widely used out there. I know I certainly used them when I was a medical student. And Professor Moore said, quote, It has been a great pleasure for me to help clarify statements in the Quran about human development. It is clear to me that these statements must have come to Muhammad from God or Allah because most of this knowledge was not discovered until many centuries later. This proves to me that Muhammad must have been a messenger of God or Allah. Now, this statement attributed to Professor Moore uh, in multiple sources on the web uh, is quite a phenomenal statement. And our task will be to see why 
Professor Moore would say this as a scholar of anatomy and of embryology, but as a non-Muslim. What is it about the Quran and embryology that captivated him so? So let's begin with verses 13 and 14 from Surah Al-Mu'minun. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم ثم جعلناه نطفة في قرار مكين Then we placed him as a drop of sperm in a place of rest firmly fixed. And so this is now talking about the beginning of the human being, the beginning of embryogenesis. ثم خلقنا النطفة علقة فخلقنا العلقة مضغة فخلقنا المضغة عظاما فكسونا العظام لحما ثم أنشأناه خلقا آخر فتبارك الله أحسن الخالقين. Then we made the sperm into a clot of congealed blood. Then of that clot we made a fetus lump. Then we made out of that lump bones and clothed the bones with flesh. Then we developed out of it another creature. So blessed be Allah, the best to create. Now we will talk about this verse, verse 14, in small bits and pieces, and also talk about how modern science has changed our interpretation, how the English translation, and probably the way the, of course, ancient Arabs understood it, would now be radically changed by what we have learned in the realm of embryology. So let's take the first part of the verse. ثُمَّ خَلَقْنَا النُطْفَةَ عَلَقَةً we have made the sperm into a clot of congealed blood. Alaqa does not really mean a blood clot. Alaqa has a primary meaning of something which hangs down, something which dangles. A secondary meaning is something which leeches, the way a leech will leech blood. And so if we look very shortly after implantation of the embryo in the uterus after fertilization in the fallopian tube and travel of the zygote and then implantation into the uterus where we have a stage of embryogenesis known as the blastocyst stage we see that this blastocyst is hanging down from a stalk from the endometrial wall from the blood-lined wall of the uterus here is a different depiction of it where Placental membranes, umbilical cord, etc. have not yet developed and this microscopic ball of cells is leaching its blood supply from the endometrial wall of the mother. And so now we would interpret alaqa in a completely different way using its primary meaning which is something which hangs or its secondary meaning, something which leeches, the way a leech leeches blood, rather than really a completely tertiary meaning, which is a clot of congealed blood, because that probably was the best that translators at the time could do and the best people could understand in the year 700. These truths that we are looking at were not revealed until well after the invention of the microscope. Then what happens to the th this alaqa? The verse continues, فَخَلَقْنَا الْعَلَقَةَ مُضْغَةً فَخَلَقْنَا الْمُضْغَةَ عِظَامًا Then out of that clot, which we now know is not a clot, but alaqa, something which dangles, we made a fetus lump. Then we made out of that lump bones. So this is a continuation again of verse 14 of Surah 23, Surah Al-Mu'minun. But again, the primary meaning of mudgha is something which is chewed, a chewed lump of flesh. So now look at the embryo, how it develops at about four weeks. This is what it looks like. This is what is known as a somite embryo. And these ridges, which look like teeth marks, are known as somites. And here's a comparison, a chewed piece of gum with the teeth marks, to see how the somite embryo looks very much like a mudra, i.e. something which has been chewed, a chewed lump of flesh. And it is indeed from these somites 
that the mesodermal structures, the cartilage that turns into bone and the muscle emerge. So indeed, the mudra does become the uh, basis of the skeleton of the embryo. Now, very importantly, the actual size of the embryo at this stage is about like this. It is three to five millimeters. It would be like a grain of rice. And it would have been absolutely impossible for somebody in the 7th century or even in the 15th century to have seen it because if the embryo is expelled, it will be expelled with a lot of blood to pick it out and to see the somite ridges on it. That did not happen until the development of the microscope by Leeuwenhoek in the 17th century. And it was really much better characterized later than the 17th century. And so now we would translate mudra not as a fetus lump, but as a somite embryo. So now let's look at the, the bits together. ثم خلقنا النطفة علاقة فخلقنا العلاقة مضغة فخلقنا المضغة عظاما فكسونا العظام لحمة. I would like to stop here at this point and go directly to a wonderful article that was written by Dr. Keith Moore that was uh, published in the Journal of the Islamic Medical Association in 1986 and the title of the article was A Scientist's Interpretation of References to Embryology in the Quran. And from here on out I'm going to pretty much let Professor Moore do the heavy lifting for me. I will just quote from this article with a few clarifications here and there because he has done such a wonderful job and because he is a recognized international expert in embryology and because he is a non-Muslim scholar who has no preconceived bias toward the truth of the Quran. So what does he say? So I'm quoting directly from this article now. The Arabic word mudra means chewed substance or chewed lump. Toward the end of the fourth week, the human embryo looks somewhat like a chewed lump of flesh. The chewed appearance results from the somites, which resemble teeth marks. The somites represent the beginnings or primordia of the vertebrae. Then Professor Moore quotes in his article the part of the verse that فَخَلَقْنَا الْمُضَوَطَ عِظَامًا فَكَسَوْنَا الْعِظَامَ لَحْمًا Then we made out of the chewed lump bones and clothed the bones in flesh. This is his translation. Then he says this continuation of Surah 2314 uh, indicates that out of the chewed lump stage, bones and muscles form. This is in accordance with embryological development. First, the bones form as cartilage models, and then the muscles, flesh, develop around them from the somatic mesoderm. The mesoderm is the structure uh, the cell types in the embryo that give rise to the bones and the muscles. And so we now get a sense of, number one, the miracle of the verses about embryology in the Quran, and number two, why Professor Moore was so intrigued. We will continue, inshallah, with one more lecture about embryology in the Quran, so that we can finish up a few more observations, both about verse 14 and about some of the other verses, and I will continue quoting from Dr. Moore's article. Salamu alaikum and see you next time, inshallah. Salamu alaikum and welcome back to Science and the Quran. We are continuing with the second part of our embryology series. As you remember, we were going through verse 14 of Surah Al-Mu'minun, and we had already talked about the first part of the verse. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم ثم خلقنا النطفة علقة فخلقنا العلقة مضغة فخلقنا المضغة عظاما فكسونا العظام لحما. Now we would like to talk about this part of the verse. ثُمَّ أَنْشَأْنَاهُ خَلْقًا آخَرَ فَتَبَارَكَ اللَّهُ أَحْسَنُ الْخَالِقِينَ 
So let's focus on this part. Then we developed out of it another creature. So blessed be Allah, the best to create or the best of the creators. Now, this verse seems to discuss that in embryogenesis, there are different stages. And indeed, this was also discussed by Professor Keith Moore, who you heard about last time. I quoted extensively from him. And if we notice, in the very early stages of the embryo, in the somite embryo stage, there's a great deal of similarity, really, between a reptile, a bird, and a human. Humans even have gill slits, the way that fish do, and so do reptiles, and so do birds. And then, as we change, so here is a tortoise, a chick, a rabbit, a human. Here's the very early stage of embryogenesis where they appear so similar. And then we are developed in different stages until we differentiate as human beings and become quite different from a tortoise or a chick. And so this verse of the Quran, or this portion of the verse rather, has been felt to describe the notion of the different stages of embryogenesis that we start off as something and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala creates us as something else. Now this is a very interesting point and Dr. Moore actually talks about how this notion of the embryo developing in stages is a very very modern notion and that the modern staging of human embryos didn't really come about until the 19th century and the 20th century and certainly would not have been possible before the invention of the microscope. Before that, people probably thought that a human was created as a miniature fetus and then simply grew in the womb. This notion of entirely different stages of being is a very, very modern one that would have been impossible to know in um, 7th century Arabia and certainly was not known in the Middle Ages. Now let's go to another verse. This is verse 6 from Surah Az-Zumar, Surah 39. And what um, I would like to do here is just focus on one portion of the verse. It is cr talking about how we have been created from a single soul, a single person, and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala creates from it its mate, and that he also sends down uh, different uh, types of cattle. And then here is our portion of interest. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم يخلقكم في بطون أمهاتكم خلقا من بعد خلق في ظلمات ثلاث. That he creates you in the wombs of your mothers in stages one after the other. We have already talked about that in uh, the verse from Surah Al-Mu'minun that we were just discussing. Then this verse adds in three veils of darkness that we undergo this multi-stage embryogenesis and three veils of darkness. And, in fact, Professor Moore, in his article, A Scientist's Interpretation of References to Embryology in the Quran, says, and I quote directly from him once again, the three veils of darkness may refer to the anterior abdominal wall of the mother, then the wall of the uterus, and then the amniochorionic membrane, the sac where the amniotic fluid sits, and the baby is inside that amniotic sac. And so he says, although there are other interpretations of this statement, the one presented here seems the most logical from an embryological point of view. And he was quite amazed that the Quran is talking about these three different layers or three different veils of darkness. And of course, the fetus is entirely in darkness at uh, this stage and that's why when babies are born they're really not able to see and it takes several weeks for the brain to myelinate the occipital cortex which is the visual part of the brain and that's about when a baby begins to be able to focus. Now Surat as sajda Surah 32 verse 9 also talks about something that Professor Moore finds quite interesting, which is the stage, the staging of the development of the different faculties of the fetus. And so the verse says, 
but he fashioned him in due proportion and breathed into him something of his spirit, and he gave you the faculties of hearing and sight and feeling or understanding, little thanks do you give. And again, I quote directly from Professor Moore, as I said, I'm going to have the luxury here of having him do the heavy lifting once again, because he is an internationally recognized professor of anatomy and embryology. His textbooks in anatomy and embryology are very widely used in medical schools in the US. And he says, this part of Surah 32.9 indicates that the special senses of hearing, seeing, and feeling develop in this order, which is true. The primordia of the internal ears appear before the beginning of the eyes, and the brain, i.e. the sight of understanding, differentiates last. And so we see that there's really a great deal of subtlety in verses that we may not have paused to think about in this way. And as we learn something about embryology, we are truly amazed by what the Quran says. Now, let's take a look at sort of the overall view of creation, of the life of the human. And so in Surah Al-Hajj, verse 5, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuha nasu in kuntum fi raibin min al-ba'ath, فَإِنَّا خَلَقْنَاكُمْ مِنْ تُرَابٍ ثُمَّ مِنْ نُطْفَةٍ ثُمَّ مِنْ عَلَقَةٍ ثُمَّ مِنْ مُضْغَةٍ مُخَلَّقَةٍ وَغَيْرِ مُخَلَّقَةٍ لِنُبَيِّنَ لَكُمْ وَنُقِرُّ فِي الْأَرْحَامِ مَا نَشَاءُ إِلَى أَجَلٍ مُسَمَّى ثُمَّ نُخْرِجُكُمْ طِفْلًا ثُمَّ لِتَبْلُغُوا أَشُدَّكُمْ وَمِنْكُمْ مَنْ يُتَوَفَّى وَمِنْكُمْ مَنْ يُرَدُّ إِلَى أَرْضَ لِلْعُمُرِ لِكَيْ لَا يَعْلَمَ مِنْ بَعْدِ عِلْمٍ شَيْئًا And I will stop here with the Arabic. And now let's translate. O oh mankind, if you have a doubt about the resurrection, consider that we created you out of dust, then out of sperm then out of a leech-like clot, and we've already clarified that alaqa does not mean a, a clot, it could mean a leech, or it could mean something which dangles, which is its primary meaning, the way the embryo does in the blastocyst stage, then out of a morsel of chewed flesh, that's the mudra, and partly formed and partly unformed. And we'll get back to that in a second. Mukhallaqatin wa ghayri mukhallaqan in order that we may manifest our power to you, and we cause whom we will to rest in the wombs for an appointed term, then do we bring you out as babes, then foster you that ye may reach your age of full strength, and some of you are called to die, and some are sent back to the feeblest old age, so that they know nothing after having known much, and this would of course be the stage of dementia that sometimes besets the very elderly. So, Professor Moore then talks about two parts of this verse. One is this notion of a chewed lump of flesh, which is partly formed and partly unformed. And what he says about that, and so here's that somite embryo. In his article, once again, a scientist's interpretation of references to embryology in the Quran, then out of a piece of chewed flesh, partly formed and partly unformed. This part of Surah 22.5 seems to indicate that the embryo is composed of both differentiated and undifferentiated tissues. For example, when the cartilage and bones are differentiated, the embryonic connective tissue or mesenchyme around them is, is undifferentiated. It later differentiates into muscles and ligaments attached to the bones. And so that is his interpretation of that portion of the verse. Again, an absolutely amazing insight into the Quran. I'm not saying this is what the Quran definitively meant, but I'm saying that it may have meant that, but at least now we can understand it in a very, very sophisticated way that really brings out the majesty of the Quran. And then Professor Moore goes back to talk about this portion of the verse, وَنُقِرُّ فِي الْأَرْحَامِ مَا نَشَاءُ إِلَىٰ أَجَلٍ مُسَمَّةٍ that we cause whom we will to rest in the wombs for an appointed term. This next part of Surah 22.5 seems to imply that God determines which embryos will remain in the uterus until full term. And then he goes on to say that it is well known that many embryos abort during the first month of development and that only about 30% of zygotes that form develop into fetuses that survive until birth. Now this is amazing because this is a very, very modern discovery. 
in the 7th century, even in the 17th century, these fertilized zygotes would simply have failed to implant in the uterus and the woman would have a normal or nearly normal period and not even realize that she was pregnant. This notion that so many fertilized ova, so many potential embryos do not remain in the uterus and that God decides who will rest in the wombs for their appointed term and survive until birth, this is a very, very new and modern notion that the Quran is stating outright. So all of these things together led Professor Moore and should now lead us to the same conclusion that, and I quote directly from him and we'll end here inshallah, the interpretation of the verses in the Quran referring to human development would not have been possible in the 7th century AD or even a hundred years ago. We can interpret them now because the science of modern embryology affords us new understanding. Undoubtedly, there are other verses in the Quran related to human development that will be understood in the future as our knowledge increases. And there is nothing really I can add to that except subhanallah and salamu alaikum. We'll see you next time, inshallah. Okay, so that was the end of that. So I'm uh, trying to, again, share my screen with you here. And uh, can you still hear me, Sheikh Hassan? Yes. Okay, so what uh, I would like to do, I am just uh, trying to, uh, figure out a way to bring myself up here on the uh, on the camera, but I guess I will struggle with that later since I still have the screen. Let me go now to uh, the commentary I wanted to make. So again, as Sheikh Hassan said, uh, we are now nearly done with lecture one, which is embryology in the Quran. I, I certainly hope, uh, inshallah, you, you enjoyed that and found it illuminating. Uh, next week, we will talk about the miracle of water. The Quran talks about how water is the basis of life, and uh, we will try to take a scientific understanding of what is so special about water. And then lectures three and four uh, really uh, uh, among kind of my favorite topics, um, the story of sunshine and iron. And I'll leave that title a little bit cryptic, but it is basically tracing the, the very fascinating journey of humanity to understand something about how the sun works. In, in ancient times, you looked up, you saw a bright orb in the sky, uh, and it's only really in the 20th century that we began to have some understanding of how does the sun shine? And we'll try to relate that to, to verses in the Quran and also just to deepen our own knowledge and, and background appreciation of one of the most fascinating intellectual journeys in human history to unlock the mystery of the sun and see what in the world does that have to do with iron. So I'll uh, leave us on a cliffhanger there. And let me now just um, again uh, comment uh, to, to wrap up uh, this lecture before taking your questions. Uh, so the one addition that I would like to make to the material, uh, we have talked about the stages of, of embryogenesis and how the embryo begins as a ball of cells, differentiates into a somite embryo that looks very similar across all different creatures. And then from there, each creature differentiates to what it is, the human becomes a human, the turtle becomes a turtle and so forth. Now this brings up a very significant question and a question that is entirely unsolved at this time. Uh, we've talked about how science is advanced, but science has still many, many advances that it needs to make. And this is the problem of morphogenesis. Morphogenesis, is how does a ball of cells develop into these stages? How is it that we 
basically, let me uh, put it to you this way. You know that every cell in the fertilized ovum, in the beginning embryo, uh, has the same DNA. It has the, the same 46 chromosomes. So if you have a ball of cells, yes, they can keep dividing, but they should probably just grow into a bigger and bigger and bigger ball of identical cells. How is it that cells that all share the same genetic material become entirely different things? Some of them migrate up and become the brain and the eyes. Some of them migrate down and become the gonads. Some of them migrate across and become the somites and the muscle and the bone. Uh, that must mean that there's something above and beyond the DNA. We used to think even as, as short as 30, 40 years ago that the DNA decides everything. But of course, that doesn't answer the question of how identical cells with the same DNA then begin doing different things. Because your brain cell and your liver cell and your heart cell and your blood cell, um, at least at the beginning, blood cells, all have the same uh, DNA. Uh, and yet they become very, very different things because some of the genes are turned on, others are turned off, depending on, are we a brain cell? Are we a liver cell? Are we a heart cell? Are we uh, you know, a, a spleen cell, a pancreas cell, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so some maestro has to be above and beyond the, the DNA telling this particular cell, you turn on these genes, and another cell, no, you turn on this different set of genes, so you could become a different cell type. And that's the problem of morphogenesis. And only really in the last uh, decade or two, scientists have begun to talk about this issue. They've been fascinated by morphogenesis for a while, but it's only really become a serious field now in terms of advances in the last, uh, I'd say, 20 years, you know, give or take. And scientists are now talking about information fields that sort of surround a fetus, but nobody has any idea where the information comes from or very much how it's encoded. Very recently, you see this paper from 2017, um, uh, Michael Levin, uh, he's at Boston uh, University, uh, Tufts University rather in Boston, uh, has discovered that there seems to be sort of an electric code, an electric field. Uh, he was studying uh, planaria flatworms and that they have an electric field surrounding them that he feels encodes the information. And why does he feel that? Because these worms uh, can do something rather incredible. If you take a worm and you cut it, let's say you cut it right in half, you will have part of the worm that has the head and the eyes, but no tail, and part that has a tail, but no head or eyes. And the part that has the head, but no tail will grow a new tail. The part that has the tail, but no head will grow a new head. The question becomes, if you make the cut right in the middle here, these, these are the exact cells that somehow the cells that have a tail attached to them, but they're far away from the tail, know that they have a tail attached but are missing a head. The exact same cells on the exact same cut line that have the head attached know, hey, I'm missing a tail, I need to grow a tail. And when he played with the electric fields, he was able to grow worms that then had two heads. So you would cut it here and it would grow a second upper half and it would have two heads. He grew worms that had two tails and no heads. And the very interesting thing is that when these worms reproduce, they still have the same DNA as the original worm but this two-headed worm will produce another two-headed worm. This worm with no heads will produce another worm with no heads, even though the genes here are identical to the genes here, are identical to the genes here. And so what seems to have happened is that Professor Levin has figured out how to tamper with the information field, which is the conductor 
or the maestro of orchestrating the DNA. Um, there are other fascinating examples in science, and this field is very, very new. We have no idea where the information comes from. We have no idea how that information is encoded, but now scientists do firmly believe. Paul Davies, for example, some of you may know his name as a famous physicist who's taken an interest in biology and information theory uh, at the University of Arizona. Uh, has written a very nice book, The Demon in the Machine, uh, talking about uh, th this notion of how science is now just beginning to come to grips with information. Before we used to talk about that there's matter and there's energy, now something even more basic or more profound than matter and energy is information. And scientists are saying we really don't have a good theory about information. We have good theories about matter, good theories about energy, uh, uh, but no good uh, theories at all about information. And it is this field of sort of information biology that is behind this notion of uh, morphogenesis, which is really an even bigger miracle than, than the things we talked about. But of course, we still don't know enough to really talk about it. We can just say, here's the problem, but we have no solutions as of yet. So I do hope, inshallah, that you have uh, found this uh, interesting. And uh, I will now attempt to get out of here to minimize this and figure out how I can see you and you can see me. Uh, that is the part that I do not seem to be able to crack here. If you uh, just click on uh, stop sharing, Dr. Gasser, I think that will be it. Click on the stop share. Ah, yes, click on that. Ah. Now we see you. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. SubhanAllah, this was amazing and eye-opening. Thank you so much, Dr. Gasser, for this beautiful presentation. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you and bless your family. And there's a good question. And I would like to read for you, if you could please uh, respond to this question. Uh, the, it is, could the, the three vulumats refer to the stages of trimesters of the pregnancy? Okay, so um, it, it is conceivable that they could refer to the trimesters of the pregnancy, uh, but the trimesters are... Um, there's no reason to call them volumet. There's nothing uh, about them that shields the embryo from light or encases the embryo so that they are in a veil of darkness. That's number one. Number two, uh, the trimesters are, of course, um, a, a much more subjective or human invention because we could have made them, you know, uh, quadrimesters if we uh, decided that we're going to take the uh, 36 weeks, if you will, are you really pregnant? She should be 40 weeks and we divide them into 13 weeks, but the minimum 36 weeks, 12 weeks apiece. Uh, if we had decided instead to make them four stages and divide them into 10 week stages, we could have made them four or five. Uh, the notion of having an anterior abdominal wall, a uterine wall and an amniotic sac, that's hard anatomic stuff. And you can't, make them two and you can't make them four. Uh, it, it, there is the, the abdominal wall, there's the uterine wall, there's the amniotic sac and, uh, you know, uh, obstetricians who do um, cesarean sections to get a baby out know that they have to cut through these three. We're gonna cut the abdominal wall, we'll expose the uterus, we'll cut the uterus open, then expose the, you know, have the amniotic sac and cut the amniotic sac and get the baby out. So, uh, I, I think the trimesters is kind of more of our overlay onto the pregnancy. I, I, I don't want to say it can't mean that. It's a very uh, a smart comment and it's not something I thought of uh, for sure, but I, but I, I still like uh, the anatomical um, interpretation uh, better. Great. Yes. Thank you so much, Dr. Gesser. There's another question. It is, uh, do you know that Professor Moore become a Muslim? It is very nice that he acknowledged. Uh, as far as I know, no, he did not become a Muslim, but he clearly acknowledged uh, the truth of, uh, of the Quran. Uh, but um, the, uh, 
uh, he, after this, did go take uh, a, a brief professorship uh, in, in the Middle East, um, uh, I think in Saudi Arabia, if I remember correctly. Um, uh, but I think he was invited there because of, you know, when, when, when his, his comments kind of became known in the Muslim world. Um, so no, but I, I, as far as I'm aware, he never formally converted to Islam. Great, thank you. And related to the first question, there's a uh, kind of question. Might the darkness be reflective of the fact that the embryo is ophthalmologically blind? So of course, yes, the embryo is, as we said, blind because they, they have not myelinated their visual apparatus. Um, I personally, I believe that it's the other way around, that the embryo is blind because there is no light to see in, in the, in the, within the three veils that house the embryo, uh, no light can penetrate. And uh, you know that, for example, fish that live below a certain depth in the ocean are also ophthalmologically blind, and they are blind because light does not penetrate that far down and dissipates in the water. And so those fish um, uh, even have no eyes. Uh, so, uh, and, and again, the embryos blind all the way through until birth. Uh, so I wouldn't know how to make something become three. Why three veils of darkness? Um, and so again, I prefer the anatomic explanation and prefer the explanation that um, the darkness is not because the embryo is blind, the embryo is blind because of the darkness. And the darkness is because you know, when you put a blanket over you and little babies love to not be able to see because they put the blanket, they can't see them, they lift the blanket. And now, you know, they can see you or, you know, whatever. Um, but here the fetus is not inside one veil, they're inside three. And we know the anatomy uh, of, of that. Uh, but again, a very interesting question, thank you. Mashallah, that's amazing. And we have two more questions, Dr. Gasser, if you have time. The sure. first one is, how do you reconcile your interest in scientific evidence in Quran with pure faith? Could scientific evidence of the Quran's accuracy be used as a justification of belief in Islam? Isn't faith as a prerequisite contradictory to pure scientific investigation? Yeah, so, um, so the Quran, of course, uh, says in Surah Al-Imran, إِنَّ فِي خَلْقِ السَّمَوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَاخْتِلَافِ اللَّيْلِ وَالنَّهَارِ لَآيَاتٍ لِأُولِي الْأَلْبَابِ um, uh, That in the creation of the heavens and the earth and the uh, alternation of the night and the day or the difference between the night and the day are signs for those who have been given wisdom. الَّذِينَ تَفَكَّرُونَ فِي خَلْقِ السَّمَوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ That, you know, the verse goes on later. Um, I don't want to take the time to quote the whole verse, but yathafakarun means they, they ponder deeply. Uh, uh, that uh, so it's a it's a fine line because we don't want to be using science to validate the Quran, which is what I said right at the beginning of the first lecture, that we are coming at this as believers. I much prefer using science to get a better appreciation of the Quran because science at one point told us the earth was flat and science told us that the earth was the center of the universe and science told us that, uh, you know, uh, matter is infinitely divisible and then we discovered atoms. So science before every advance and every discovery is a mistake, uh, some mistaken notion that then becomes improved. And so, uh, for example, the notion of the expanding universe, which I've talked about in other settings and other uh, videos, uh, even Einstein himself, who was the best out of the box thinker, refused to acknowledge the idea that the universe expands even when his equations of general relativity predicted that the universe had to be dynamic. So he threw in something called the cosmological constant to keep the universe static. And we go back and we, we find the Quran telling us that 
God has created the universe with power and we are expanding it. Um, but people who had lived before Edwin Hubble's discovery of the expanding universe in 1929, they would have really had a hard time because science for 2000 years has said that the universe is static and not expanding, yet the Quran says it's expanding. So what do we do? So I don't like using science to try to validate the Quran, but, um, but I do find that it is an avenue of increasing faith and maybe even of coming to faith. Why not? Faith has many, many doors. Uh, and, uh, you know, the story of Musa and Pharaoh and, and the sorcerers, uh, uh, Musa alayhi salam shows the miracles. Uh, the sorcerers fall prostrate and they say, you know, we believe in the God of Musa and Harun. And Pharaoh says, I'm going to crucify you and cut your hands and feet. And they say, do whatever you will. We believe in God. Um, but everybody else in the room didn't. They all saw the same thing. Why? Because the sorcerers knew magic. That, that's the, the science of, of the time. And they knew enough science to understand that what Musa alayhi salam was showing was not a magic trick. Pharaoh sees the same thing. And he says, he's your leader. He's the one who taught you magic. He just thinks Musa is a better magician and doesn't and, and misses the, the miracle before him because of lack of knowledge. So I would say, yes, science can be a way of coming to faith, but that our approach shouldn't be trying to use science to prove the Quran because we've seen science change its, its conclusions many times but we do the best we can with the knowledge we have as people of faith. I, I, I know that's a long-winded answer, but, but I, I, I think it's an important question. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gess. And one more question. Uh, where is the Quran stand on fertility enhancement? Uh, that is a question that is beyond me. Uh, I, I don't know that the Quran has a stand on fertility enhancement, and I don't know what the question is getting at, to be very honest with you. Um, I am not, um, uh, uh, I don't want to say, uh, well, I'm certainly not authorized. I'm also not fit to give fatwas. Uh, people really need to, to be at a certain level of uh, very broad and very deep scholarship, even though a lot of people don't observe that and just throw fatwas out there. Uh, but fertility enhancement, so I'm, I'm saying outright, I do not meet the qualifications to give fatwas. Uh, fertility enhancement um, can take many forms. If you want to take uh, medication to increase the, the number of eggs that are put out by the ovaries, I myself would not have an issue with that, and God knows best, but that is not a fatwa. That's my opinion. Um, if you were to try to enhance fertility in other ways that are outside the, the normal scope of, uh, of uh, fertilization, then it becomes a more difficult problem. My uncle Hassan, of course, was professor of obstetrics and gynecology and a very famous medical ethicist. And uh, he has written uh, in medical ethics about his opinions about what is lawful and what is unlawful and so forth. Um, and uh, uh, I myself, again, uh, um, I'm just not fit to, to, to give uh, opinions in this realm, but um, uh, perhaps if, if his writings in this area and his fatwas are available, um, you know, people can consult that, inshallah. Sure. Thank you, Dr. Gasser. There are two more questions. I don't know if you have time. If you wish to take, I can read if, would you I, like to take two more I, questions? Sure, of course. I'll do the best I can, inshallah. Sure. And the, the next question is, says, uh, for morphogenesis, energy fields, elect electromagnetic fields, might these explain the this morphology from atomic bombs, et cetera? I don't know if the question was. Oh, yes, yes, so I understand the question. Uh, so uh, yes, I mean, it's, it's a very, very good question. Uh, and uh, it, it um, 
could conceivably, I suppose, uh, do that. Uh, but um, we sort of, I think, have uh, a fair bit of study in, in uh, the entire field of radiation biology. Uh, and the dysmorphology from atomic bombs, yes, they will cause, of course, a very strong electromagnetic pulse and can disrupt the electric fields, but it would have to be a developing embryo, you know, then and there. Uh, and, and you would disrupt its electric field at the time it was growing. But we have pretty well established uh, science uh, from fruit flies on up, the Drosophilia fruit fly experiments with radiation, that radiation breaks uh, the strands of DNA. And if they're not repaired correctly, they misrepair and that the mutations that result can then cause the, the uh, um, you know, disruption or morphogenesis uh, or dysgenesis rather, I should say, um, so that the person exposed to an atomic blast may then 10 years later give rise to, uh, you know, uh, a, 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 a progeny, uh, et cetera, as they reproduce that, that are um, affected depending on whether the stem cells that produce the sperm and eggs suffer a, a major catastrophic uh, blast. But, but it's a very interesting thought. And as I said, uh, I, I'm just answering off the top of my head, uh, but there are studies, uh, for example, antlers of deer um, and the deer shed the antlers and next year grow a new set of antlers. And if you go, then the antlers, you know them, they branch like a tree with multiple branches. If you go to one of those branches and make a cut, when the deer sheds those antlers and grows new antlers, at the place you made the cut, a new branch or stump will grow. And scientists, as of last year, are still baffled and mystified. How does the deer know when you go two feet away from the top of the head and make a cut in one of the branches of the antler, then those fall off and next year it grows new antlers. It records the location of the cut. And where is that information stored? No one has any idea at, at this point that the phenomena is known, but there's no explanation whatsoever. Uh, and so why not? I, I think it's a very smart idea. Perhaps the information field that gets transmitted along with the embryo, because that information field has to exist somewhere um, to, to kind of direct the embryo in, in this uh, morphogenesis. Maybe it does get disrupted by, uh, by radiation or electromagnetic pulses. Um, God knows best. Alhamdulillah, these are amazing informations, uh, Dr. Gasser. thank you. And final question, inshallah, we'll finish with this one. I think this refers uh, to the first question. Uh, about three Dolomat uh, question. Uh, she asks, can the three veils of darkness be not seeing, tasting, and getting hurt? Um, I, I suppose. I suppose it, they, they definitely can be. Um, uh, but again, um, uh, I mean, that's the beauty of the Quran. I mean, it's open to so many interpretations and who's to say what is right and what is wrong. Uh, so, but, you know, there's a lot of sensory deprivation because then what about smell? Um, you know, why not make it four? Why not make it sensory, uh, you know, and make it five? Why not? Uh, so, Again, I like the three because, as I said, anatomically, it's just so straightforward. And that's, of course, what, what Dr. Keith Moore was so intrigued by, um, that, you know, it is just three, three layers. Um, uh, but if we want to make it about sensory deprivation, I mean, it, it, you know, you have visual sensory deprivation, you have tactile sensory deprivation, you have taste deprivation, you have smell deprivation, you have... So uh, you have auditory deprivation but, uh, up to a certain point, and then the fetus does begin to hear, and that's why you talk to your baby you know, in the womb. Uh, so so I, I wouldn't know how to parse it and turn that into three in a neat way, to be honest with you, but I'm not saying it doesn't mean that. I, I have 
no knowledge. I'm just uh, the, the anatomy is kind of what makes the, the the most sense to me, and God knows best. But I, in any case, I, I do, inshallah, hope that you you found this uh, stimulating in terms of thought, and I hope uh, inspirational in terms of faith. Inshallah. Thank you so much, Dr. Jasper. This was a beautiful uh, presentation, and thank you for answering the questions. Before we end, actually, I would like to ask kindly from our audience, uh, you know, this program is recorded on our Facebook, and then also it'll be put on our YouTube channel. Please share with your friends, Muslims and non-Muslims, and these are really amazing uh, information. And for this, again, I thank you so much, Dr. Gassir, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you and bless your family members. And we'll see you next Thursday with the topic of the miracle of water, inshallah, at the same time. Thank you. Inshallah, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Thank you, Dr. Gassir. And now, dear brothers and sisters, I'm going to call the event and we'll pray Salatul Aisha together, inshallah. Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar. Shadu an la ilaha illa Allah. Shadu an la ilaha illa Allah. Shadu anna Muhammad al-Rasulullah. Shadu anna Muhammad al-Rasulullah. I am a salad.
ونقر في الأرحام ما نشاء إلى أجل مسمى ثم نخرجكم طفلا ثم لتبلوا أشدكم ومنكم من يتوفى ومنكم من يرد إلى أرض للعمر إلى أرض للعمر لكي لا يعلم من بعد علم شيئا وترى الأرض هامدة فإذا أنزلنا عليها الماء اهتزت وربت وأنبتت من كل زوج بهيج ذلك بأن الله هو الحق وأنه يحيي الموتى وأنه على كل شيء قدير الله أكبر سمع الله لمن حمده الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين اقرأ باسم ربك الذي خلقه خلق الإنسان من علقه اقرأ وربك الأكرم الذي علم بالقلم علم الإنسان ما لم يعلم الله أكبر سمع الله لمن حمله الله أكبر الله أكبر سمع الله لمن حمله الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إياك نعبد الله أكبر سمع الله لمن حمده الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر اللهم صل على رسول
السلام عليكم ورحمة الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله استغفر الله استغفر الله استغفر الله العظيم الذي لا إله إلا هو اللهم أنت السلام ومنك السلام تبارك يا ذا الجلال والإكرام اللهم أعنا على ذكرك وشكرك وحسن عبادتك سبحان الله والحمد لله ولا إله إلا الله والله أكبر ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الله لا إله إلا هو الحي القيوم لا تأخذه سنة ولا نوم له ما في السماوات وما في الأرض من ذا الذي يشفع عنده إلا بإذنه يعلم ما بين أيديهم وما خلفهم ولا يحيطون بشيء من علمه إلا بما شاء وسع كرسيه السماوات والأرض ولا يؤوده حفظهما وهو العلي العظيم صدق الله العظيم سبحان الله 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 الحمد لله الحمد لله الحمد لله الحمد لله الحمد لله الله أكبر 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 الله لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له له الملك وله الحمد يحيي ويميت وهو على كل شيء قدير بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسولنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار ربنا اغفر لنا ولوالدينا وللمؤمنين يوم يقوم الحساب ربنا فاغفر لنا ذنوبنا وكفر عنا سيئاتنا وتوفنا مع الأبرار اللهم حبب إلينا الإيمان وزيه في قلوبنا وكره إلينا الكفر والفسوق والعصيان واجعلنا من الراشدين اللهم يا مقلب القلوب ثبت قلوبنا على دينك وطاعتك اللهم أرنا الحق حقا وارزقنا اتباعه وأرنا الباطل باطلا وارزقنا اجتنابه اللهم اشف مرضانا وارحم موتانا اللهم اشف مرضانا وارحم موتانا اللهم اغفر للمؤمنين والمؤمنات والمسلمين والمسلمات الأحياء منهم والأموات إنك سميع قريب مجيب التعوات O oh Allah, you are the most merciful, the most compassionate, the Lord of the whole universe. Please forgive us, forgive our parents, forgive all the believers. O oh Allah, please grant us the goodness of this world and hereafter. O oh Allah, make faith dear to us and beautified in our hearts and make disbelief, sin and disobedience dislike to us and make us among the rightly guided. Our Lord, you are the controller of the hearts. Please turn our hearts to your religion and obedience. O oh Allah, show us the truth as true and inspire us to follow it and show us the falsehood as falsehood and inspire us to abstain from it. O oh Allah, our Lord, our creator, please grant healings for those who are sick and forgive uh, the mistakes of those who passed away and mercy upon their souls and accept them in paradise. Ameen. Wa salli allahumma ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. A'udhu billahi minash shaytanir rajeem. Bismillahir rahmanir rahim. Amana al-rasoolu bima unzila ilayna al-rabbihi wal-mu'minun. كلنا آمن بالله وملائكته وكتبه ورسله لا نفرق بين أحد من رسله 
وقالوا سمعنا وأطعنا غفرانك ربنا وإليك المصير لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا وسعها لها ما كسبت وعليها ما اكتسبت ربنا لا تؤاخذنا إن نسينا أو أخطأنا ربنا ولا تحمل علينا إصرا كما حملته على الذين من قبلنا ربنا ولا تحملنا ما لا طاقة لنا به واعف عنا واغفر لنا وارحمنا أنت مولانا فانصرنا فانصرنا على القوم الكافرين صدق الله العظيم سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين الفاتحة بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهتنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الطالين آمين May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept our prayers our du'as dear brothers and sisters Thank you so much for joining us in this beautiful night. And tomorrow is Friday. Happy Friday, blessed Friday. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant you, inshallah, the best, whichever is khair for you. And before I end, I would like to remind you that um, the, the prayer is going to start as usual with Quranic recitation at 12.45. And then the khutbah is going to start at one o'clock and our khatib is going to be Brother Ahmed Kabalawi. And then in the evening, we have a special program. Please, uh, you know, uh, join us. Not only join, but also inform our brothers and sisters. And I have heard from some of the community members. They were asking if you have any information about Afghan refugee refugees in Southern California. So it's your time. It's, it's a perfect time for you to be informed. Uh, and this program is going to start tomorrow at 7 p.m. via Zoom. And you can find the link on our website. Uh, and then, inshallah, the information also will be sent in the email form tomorrow. Uh, but please join, and then whoever is interested, also invite them. Uh, so this is another important uh, issue and subject and topic. And please join us, inshallah. And if you may help in any way and any shape, that would be wonderful, inshallah, for our brothers and sisters who uh, came from Afghanistan, the refugees. And also, I would like to kindly remind you that besides Mondays and Thursdays nightly program, now we have a new program called Highlights of the Quran by late Dr. Mahir Hadhout. And again, when I mention these names, please keep them in your prayers. You know, Dr. Mahir Hadhout, Dr. Hassan Hadhout, and you know, Dr. Omar Alfi, and so many beautiful, uh, you know, uh, leaders of the community members, late um, leaders. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless their souls, inshallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept them in the highest level of paradise. Please remember them in uh, your uh, prayers, inshallah. So, and, and join us all those nightly uh, programs. And also, uh, Dr. Fathi Uthman, I know there are so many of them. And if I forget any of them, please forgive me. But uh, you know them, and please keep them in your prayers, inshallah. Um, and until I see you uh, tomorrow, uh, take care of yourselves and let's keep each other in our prayers. Again, have a great night. Peace be upon all of you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.